This episode is sponsored by SnapFluence Secrets. Are you ready to take your social media presence to the next level? Join SnapFluence Secrets, the ultimate course designed to help you master the art of content creation. Discover how to craft captivating posts tailored for Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, all while showcasing your unique photography style. Learn strategies that grow your audience organically, engage your followers, and build a brand that stands out in a crowded market. Don't miss this opportunity to unlock your creative freedom and turn your passion into a thriving moneymaker for your business. Start learning today with a free one-hour online training video at snapfluencesecrets.com. That's snapfluencesecrets.com. All right, here we go. Episode number three, season three, episode three, The Power of Not Giving Up. This is a very, very, very important topic to me because it seems like Throughout my entire life, my entire career, both musically and photographically, I think that's a word, uh, it's always been this point in my life where I've thought about giving up. Now, as a teenager, I meant physically giving up, but I don't want to go too deep into that because I never really had those feelings too much. But when you when you ever have these blinks of, of thoughts of, of giving up, it's it just seems like something happens that makes you realize that there is a reason to continue. And this, I'm mainly talking about my photography, but it happened in my music career a lot. And that's what I want to start with is talking about my music career. And when I was just an independent artist, no, no record label affiliation, just trying to do my thing. It was, it was crazy because I had these moments where I thought about no longer doing it. Is it worth it? Am I doing this for the right reasons? Am I wasting my time and my life and my money? And it always seemed like right when I was about to give up, something major happened. Something big happened for my career. Um, There was a point right around 2013, I did this tour. It was called the Paying the Ills Tour. And... It just felt like it was never going to happen. We were doing these shows with my friend Undecent, Patrick, and we were doing these shows, and we would we would play these venues, and there would be like 10 people there. It would be like a, a hole-in-the-wall bar in the middle of nowhere. Like I can remember this one. Um, it was actually at like a Mexican restaurant and they had like this little hip hop night and they booked us for our tour. And yeah, we got paid and we had sponsors and all of that. But there was literally like six people at the show and there was no stage. And if you know anything about doing small hip hop shows, it's no stage means also no stage presence to me anyway. So it was that point I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is not, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, nothing is working. I'm not gaining attention. And yes, attention isn't everything. You're supposed to do music because you want to. And I did. But when you're trying to make a business out of it, when you're trying to make these business decisions, the importance is making money. And if nobody's coming to the shows, the sponsors stop paying, you don't make money. So I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to just say, forget it and, and move on and do something else. But right about that time, I I met some people and they introduced me to this music called country rap or hip hop. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's hip hop music with country instruments like banjos and get heavy guitars and and acoustic guitars and and stuff like that and it resonated to me being from west virginia and growing up in wisconsin in, in green bay i saw both i knew the country i i grew up in the country a town of like i don't know less than a thousand people thrust into inner city green bay so I knew both, and I, and I felt like this was my move. This was it wasn't a marketing strategy. It wasn't a, a ploy to get more followers. The music just spoke to me. It, I I felt it. I realized this is what I should be doing, and so I started making more country esque music. I, my first one was Backroads, uh, and it just 
it took off. I entered this competition. If you guys know what the touch tune jukeboxes are, they're in like all the bars. There's, there's two different companies, but touch tunes is in a lot of them. It's like 80,000 of them or something like that. I entered this battle of the bands as a hip hop artist. And if you won, you got like a record deal and you got like all this other stuff, uh, money and all these other sponsorships and things. But if you got in the top 10, your song got put on these jukeboxes. Well, my song landed like third place in this competition out of a hundred thousand entries or just a ridiculous amount of people entered this thing. So Backroads got put on these jukeboxes, 70 plus thousand of them nationwide. And it really was the momentum that I needed. I, I paid like 10 bucks to get in this competition to put my song in. And here it is now on 70,000 plus jukeboxes nationwide. So I made a music video for that. I recorded it myself, filmed it, edited all of that myself, started putting out promo material. And then independently by myself, I planned the Backroads tour, which was basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to play small venues that work country with a that like hip hop, I guess you could say. So they were like little dive bars all throughout the Midwest. We went down to Alabama. We played in Nashville at a coffee shop. We played in my hometown, which was awesome because it was the first time I think ever that a hip hop show had ever been played in that area. But it was super cool. And it, so independently, I planned this. And I was like, when I was talking to myself or talking to people, I should say, I was like, this is it. If this doesn't work, I'm done with music. It's not going to happen anymore. It went super good. We played Columbus, Ohio for Al Rosa Villa, uh, which is just an incredible place that is no longer there. Uh, but it was just an incredible venue. It's actually where Dimebag Daryl from Pantera was killed. Uh, so it has history. It has, it'll always have memories in my heart, but there was a lady that ran the promoter. Her name was Mary Kaufman, and she was in touch with all of these country hip hop labels, artists, because she was doing these shows all the time there. So she put me onto this group called the Georgia Boys, and she said, they're looking for artists, reach out to them. So I sent just a quick message and introduced myself, and long story short, that's who I ended up signing to. So it was this last hurrah that I did that actually made me become a, and I'm using air quotes here, a successful, a semi-successful, a semi-famous musician. There were people, we would do shows in front of 2,000 people, in front of 1,000 people. There was consistently three to 400 people at every show. Uh, with the ex with the uh, addition of doing the custom offset stuff, the mu the song flexed, it really blew me up. But it wouldn't have been for flexed if I wasn't already doing this country rap stuff and getting and talking to the truck community and stuff like that. So it all rolled together. But the point is, is not giving up. And I didn't give up. I gave it one last push, and that's what made it work. Now let's fast forward to photography. Uh, in two thousand and nineteen. I opened my first studio. It was a little 300 square foot office. I was moving not only furniture around, but I was bringing in props when I needed it and backdrops and headshots. And But then I would move the furniture because it was the same spot. It was literally a uh, like 15 foot by 20 foot space. Actually, if you're watching the video, I'll put a picture up of me sitting in it when I moved out just so you guys can see it. But the space was small and... In 2019, I yes, I had the help from Sean from Custom Offsets, but I did not know what I was doing when it came to business or, or planning all this stuff and making things successful. It was my first year full time. And but prior to that, I was doing it part time and I was doing very well. I was doing 20 weddings a year, uh, all sorts of music videos for artists. Um, all sorts of promo stuff, family photos. I was just crushing it. I was doing very good. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to open a studio. 2019 comes around. I, I opened the studio and it, I wouldn't say it flopped, but it was not successful. There were, there was months. I mean, and I'm talking multiple months, like two, three months in a row where I didn't book anything. And I was just 
draining my account. So I almost gave up in 2019 and it was a tough time. It was a very, very tough time. And we didn't even realize at that time as, as a, as a community, as a, as a world, what was about to come in 2020. So 2019 was rough and I was looking at what I had in the bank account and I had just about to cover, I would say about 10 months of rent. And I was doing, by the end of 2019, I was doing just enough where I felt okay. My bills were paid. I was bringing some income in and stuff like that. But at the middle of 2019, I was like, I'm, I'm pretty much done with this. I, I need to get another job and I need to figure this out. And honestly, anytime that I go like more than two weeks without getting any sort of bookings, I instantly think, well, I should probably go get a job. I should probably just give this up, but I don't. Um, let's get back to the story though. At the end of 2019, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to give this one more push. I'm going to try to figure this out just like I did with music. I didn't go, oh, uh, I did this with music. Let's do this with photography. It was just kind of a subconscious thing. And I thought, I'm going to give this one more push and see what happens. And I started looking for another studio because my studio, prime location, terrible setup. Right on the main road here in town, uh, directly across from like a little Caesars and a, a little strip mall. But... I just, I needed something bigger. I needed something more um, that looked like a studio that I could make my own. So I went on Craigslist and at Craigslist is not even a thing anymore, but the, the posting, I mean, it is a thing, but nobody uses it. I guess I should say, I found this posting for this studio or for this, I should say this rental space. Uh, it was in a storage unit and it basically was the front half of a storage unit and the guy wanted like next to nothing for it because later I came to find out it's because of zoning issues and, and to have a business, it was a commercial property. He needed a physical business. So he was basically just charging what it would cost to rent one of his storage units for square footage. So, um, and, and I'll let you know that my studio that I'm in now, that is the space I'm talking about. And for all you photographers who rent studios, I pay $650 a month for 1200 square feet. Just, want to throw that out there. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm going to get the hate right there is, is from that comment. But what I, what I did is I looked at my financials and I was like, I'm going to go rent this space. I'm not going to think about it and I'm going to give it one more push. So December of 2019 on my birthday, I signed a lease for my studio. It was, there was no tiles, no heating vents or ducts, uh, no drywall on the walls. It was just steel studs. Nothing was in that place. And I told, I told Greg, my landlord, if you could get this ready in 30 days by January 1st, I basically said, but it was a little bit later than that. Actually, I will pay you six months in advance. And he said, no problem. Here you go. We got it going. So it was like, I don't know, January 12th or something like that. By the time I got moved in, I was, but I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I have for sure six months that I can give this guy. And then maybe four more months on top of that, that I'm safe. And then I'm going to start freaking out and then I'm going to give it up if I can't. And I, I told myself that I would figure out how to make one year be okay. Because if I, if I had 10 months, I could figure out two more months of, of money somehow, even if I had to go get a part-time job in the future or something like that. But I told myself, if I don't have this figured out by the end of this one-year lease, I, I quit. I give up. I, I do not do this anymore. I'm going to get a job. I will go back to side hustle or just give it up altogether. Well, we all know what happened in March of 2020. Um, but with that being said, my influx of inquiries, leads exploded. And now here's one thing. It's a kind of a side tangent, but if you can have your own studio space, you can book pretty much every person that walks through that door for a meeting when it comes to weddings. I have my front studio, my entryway set up 
so it when they sit down at a chair, everything is in front of them that answers their questions with me not even need to talk to them. Now I do, I explain everything, but this corner's canvases. This corner is a TV that's playing stuff that's showing me either behind the scenes at a wedding or they're showing actual wedding photos. All of the information is laid out in front of them. I could literally do a meeting and not say a word because you're not going to Starbucks. You're not meeting at Starbucks. You're not meeting at Dunkin. You're not meeting at whatever coffee shop. You're not meeting in the park. You're meeting in your space, which allows you to set it up how you want to to narrate the conversation. Or, or yeah. So anyway, 2020 hits, and I'm like, well, shit. Um, but here's the thing: is 2020, I got more leads. Like I said, and more leads more inquiries, and more bookings than I had ever had before. I did almost 40 weddings in 2020. Cool thing was, they were outdoors. They were all outdoor wedding, tent venues, uh, backyard venues. But because of this, and now this, I know this isn't going to work with everyone because COVID is over or however you want to say it. Don't, don't bite my head off for saying that. Um, but they had more money to spend on photographer at that time because they didn't have to pay for a venue. They didn't have to do all this stuff to make the venue look really good. They were doing these backyard weddings. So I raised my prices and I was like, this is what's up. But when I raised my prices, I also realized that I was raising my prices because my professionalism was going up. My work was getting better. The amount of stuff that they were getting was getting better. So this kind of turned into a fact that I was about to give up. And just when it happened, I bought this new studio or rented this new studio and my business blew up and it might've been dumb luck. It might've been a weird coincidence coincidence because of COVID. I don't know what it was, but the fact is, is I didn't give up. I gave it one more push, one more last hurrah. And this is how I've lived my life is and, and I'm suggesting that this is how you think about your life when you can, is when you feel like giving up, when you feel like your photography business is going down the shitter, or you feel like your life in general is going down the shitter, or or any of this, give it one more last hurrah, give it one more push, give it everything you've got. And yeah, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to give it shot and then not do anything. You have to do something to shake things up. You have to do something to create some waves. If you don't, then it's not going to work. But every time that I've given this last hurrah, I have pushed everything all in. All of my chips are in the table and the, it works. It, it has worked for me and I have no doubt that it'll work for you. So at any point, if you feel like you need to give up, especially in the photography world, if you feel like you're not getting bookings, if you feel like you're, something's not working, freaking push. Give it one more last hurrah and I, I can almost guarantee you that that it'll work, that something major will happen. It's just the way that things align in our lives that... If you just give it one more push, if you give it one more last hurrah, things will work out. Things will things will find you. Opportunities will arise that that you never knew could even happen. And this is like the 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 plateau is is never ending. Like you can always reach that next plateau. You just keep to ha have to keep pushing and keep pushing. So this is this is something that I live my life by. It's something that I, I think about all the time is when I'm ready to give up, instead of just giving up, I give it one more push, even small stuff, even a day where I'm like, well, I don't want to freaking edit anymore. Uh, I don't want to edit today. I want to sit around and watch TV. I'm like, you know what? Let's just edit one thing and then we can watch TV. And that's what I do. I push through. And then all of a sudden I've gotten a full wedding edited and something else. These are small examples, but I, I think about this all the time. Even the current diet that I'm on, um, it sucks. I, I, I hate it overall. Uh, but every time that I think about eating something bad, I'm just like, you know what? Let's just push it a little bit further. Let's, we'll eat it tomorrow. We'll eat, we'll eat the bad stuff later tonight. Let's just, for now, let's just keep going. And then later tonight comes or tomorrow comes and I'm like, you know what? Let's do it tomorrow. Let's, let's just hold off a little bit. And this is how I've been doing it is just, 
just keep pushing, keep giving it that hurrah. So I think this is where I'm going to leave you today because now that I'm, I'm pumped up, I need to go edit some stuff because I need to push through and I want to see you guys succeed too. So I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this episode helps you because you don't need to give up. You don't need to just throw in the towel and say, screw it. I'm done. Give it one more push when before you do and see what happens. You never know what can happen. You never know what opportunity is literally right around the corner. It could just be one more thing that you need to do, and, and, and there it is. There is everything you wanted. So think about that. Once again, this episode is sponsored by SnapFlu and Secrets, and my online course will be able to help you with some of this, this last hurrah, this push, because it is based around creating content, being a content creator as a photographer, how to make videos and photos and graphics and text that will generate leads to your business, set you apart from an oversaturated niche, and make sure that you're successful in the future. So if you want to check that out, free 60-minute webinar online. You can go watch it. It's a training video. All you have to do is go to snapfluencesecrets.com. Other than that, see you in the next episode. I hope that you are subscribed, and I'll see you soon. Peace.